Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Daly. I'm the editor and general manager of The Conversation. If you don't know what The Conversation is, we are a nonprofit independent news outlet that sits at the juncture of acad academia and journalism. And if you imagine our newsroom, our reporters are all the academics across America who work with our editors to translate their research into digestible journalism that then goes out to over a thousand news outlets um, every month. Um, so that's us. I'm just so pleased today. I've been excited for this webinar the whole week. Um, it, it's something that's near and dear to my heart as, as a woman leader. Um, and the women we're going to meet today are just so incredible. And the title of our uh, webinar, Women's Transformative Power in Higher Education and Beyond um, is fascinating. We're going to learn so much. So I'm going to jump right into introductions and then I'll talk a little bit about um, the book that brought us all here today and I'll explain a little bit more. Um, so let me, without further ado, let me first introduce Michelle Ozumba. Um, Michelle Ozumba is the principal and founder of Michelle Uzumba and Associates, a consulting firm which helps organizations develop effective programs to advance diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion. She's a former president of Women's College Coalition and the past CEO of the Women's Funding Network, a global philanthropic organization. Um, there's a lot more to tell about Michelle and all these women. The other thing I will say that Michelle is a conversation board member and a mentor of mine. Um, and I'm just so incredibly grateful for her insights and wisdom helping us on so many ways and especially in including our diversity initiative here at the conversation. So welcome, Michelle. Um, next, I'm just so pleased to introduce Carol Christ, the 11th chancellor and the former executive vice chancellor and provost of the University of California, Berkeley. I knew her being in Massachusetts because she was the former president of Smith College from 2002 to 2013, probably, yeah. Um, and I have many friends and many people who um, went there and just loved it there because of your leadership there. Um, before that, she was a professor of English and an administrator at Berkeley uh, for more than three decades. She's an advocate for quality, accessible public higher education, a proponent for the value of liberal arts in a broad education, and a real leader and champion on women's issues and diversity on colleges camp college campuses. So welcome, Carol. Again, your bio's too long to fully go. <laughs> and lastly, I'm just so pleased to, to introduce the president of Oberlin College, um, Carmen Twilley Amber. She's an attorney, an academic, and the current president, obviously, um, of Oberlin College in Ohio. She began there in 2017, and prior to that, she had been um, the ninth woman to lead Douglas College and was also dean of Douglas College and also was president of Cedar Crest College, if I have that right, Carmen. Um, she holds a bachelor's degree in foreign service from Georgetown, a master's degree in public administration from Princeton, a JD from um, Columbia, I think. Columbia, yeah. <laughs> many, many degrees. And we're just so pleased to for you all to join us today. Your schedules are busy, your lives are busy, and we're just so, so happy to have you. And, and we're here really because of this book that Michelle, Carmen, and Carol edited. Um, it's amazing. It's junctures in women leadership, junctures in, in, in women's leadership around higher education. And it's a fascinating look at 12 case studies of women written by leaders themselves often, looking at a moment in time of a problem, a juncture, a challenge, and how they resolved it. And, and what, what that, how that changed the institution. Um, and it, it, it runs the gamut of, you know, leaders at public universities, private, urban, um, I'm forgetting all the other ones, but it's, it's, it's very broad and it's a fascinating read. Um, so without further ado, Michelle, I'm gonna uh, jump in if that's okay with you. And I prepared a few questions for you. And the first one I have is, you know, tell us about this, the 12 stories in the, the book that were selected. I'm sure there are many other women you could have highlighted. Um, uh, and each essay is really powerful. Can you talk a little about the process? Thank you, Beth. And um, I'm really thrilled to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, before I tell you about the stories and the women profiled, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the other contributors to these chapters, because in addition to Carol, uh, Carmen and myself, we have nine women who are themselves stellar leaders in, in higher ed and researchers who brought their skills and their insights and their passions to this project. So really, 
um, when you go through the book, in addition to the women who are being profiled uh, in each chapter, the bios of the writers and the contributors are very compelling as well. So I just want to thank and acknowledge all of them. And to also give tribute to uh, the late Alison Bernstein, who uh, was the visionary for this whole series uh, and looking at women's leadership in a multiple, in a, in a diversity of sectors. And so we want to thank um, the Institute of Women's Leadership at Rutgers and Rutgers University Press for really including an opportunity to feature women leaders in higher ed. So with that, um, the 12 stories, I mean, they are, um, they are compelling. And I wanna start by first, the very first chapter is Bernice Sandler. And Bernice unfortunately passed away a few months before her publication. But uh, in many ways, even though she wasn't a university president, she really was the, the pathway for a lot of the women who are featured in the book because of her work on Title IX. And uh, what inspired her, what really, not, I wouldn't say inspired, but what ignited her was she, when she got her PhD, she was a part-time lecturer and um, there were seven open full-time positions in her department and none of which she was considered. So she asked a male colleague, you know, why, why wasn't she considered for at least one of them? And he said, well, let's face it, you come on too strong for a woman, as a woman. And so after sort of crying and uh, beating herself up for saying, yeah, maybe I talk too much, she then kind of doubled down and really began a really uh, amazing creative and um, impassioned advocacy campaign and research into and introduced the whole idea of sex discrimination. And what she discovered by looking at the civil rights movement in terms of racial discrimination, she discovered that in the, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, even though it mentioned uh, no discrimination on sex, race, religion, and so on, it excluded educational institutions. And so that really was the opening that she saw to bring forward what ended up uh, between 1969 and signed in 1972 by President Nixon was the Title IX um, uh, Act, which was an amendment to the civil rights legislation. So that groundbreaking work sort of opens the door for this whole conversation around um, gender equity, uh, as well as racial equity um, in higher ed. Um, so the book really features women who brought their individual diversity as well as institutional diversity. We feature women who are leading, um, leading private and public research universities, community colleges, there's an HBCU, there are women's colleges, there are private liberal arts colleges. So the institutional diversity was important as well as their individual path journeys to those positions of leadership. So there, of course, there are lots of women, 12 is just a snap profile, but I think what these women uh, what their careers gave us an opportunity to do was really hone in on women who, who uh, came to their positions at a time of transformation and challenge and, uh, and, uh, and, and really they give examples of what it means to manage complex systems and what it means to um, prioritize, examples of what it takes to, to create a unified purpose when there's competing interests, competing challenges, and uh, a diversity of stakeholders, which Carmen and Carol know all too well in their own roles. So that's really, in a nutshell, about the 12 stories. And, um, you know, there's Juliet Garcia, who was the first Mexican-American woman to lead a, a community college, become president. And she really did an amazing uh, job out in Texas uh, with a, a creative partnership. Um, Judy Shapiro, who who carved out uh, uh, Bernard's identity, really stood to keep it as independent from Columbia, even though it's a sister school to Columbia University. Um, Janetta Cole, who became our first sister president, <laughs> you know, and put Spelman on the top as a number one HBCU in the country that continues to hold that spot today, how many years later? So there's just a lot of really rich, compelling, interesting stories that uh, I think anyone who picks up the book will find some inspiration and uh, models of leadership there. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, well, before I ask, I have a couple of follow-up questions, but I should do some housekeeping. We have a q and A. I I see people already populating questions. One, one that, Michelle, you might know is someone is asking if there's an, a, a way to have an audio for the book. I don't know if you know that answer or not, but we will get that answer if you don't know it. Um, uh, I don't know that we have an audio version. We don't have an audio version of the book. I mean, we can check back with the publisher, but uh, to date, it's available on Amazon just as a, a print copy. Okay, absolutely. And we'll um, we'll be sharing how to get the book at the end of the webinar for sure, because I'm seeing other people ask that same question. Um, mm -hmm. And so, 
after I'm done asking Michelle some questions and Michelle will have a conversation with um, Carol and Carmen, I'll jump back in and start fielding uh, our audience questions, which are already coming in <laughs> fast and furious. So Michelle, you know, I was really curious what, I mean, you had, you all had a, a focus going into it and, and the book is sort of broken up into sort of a social lens, a structural lens, I mean, cultural lens. It, did that come about purposefully or was it when you were editing the books that these these themes emerged? Well, it was sort of purposefully at, at, in looking at them all together. Uh, and of course, these categories are not mutually exclusive. You could take a, a leader like a like a Janetta and put her in structural and cultural and social, you know, and, and that's the same for a lot of them. But what what the idea was, was to create a um, uh, designed to provide a framework for analyzing the context of their leadership decisions and really help bring some context to the challenges they were faced to what their particular juncture was and what the impact was on their decision, uh, what the major impact was of their decision making uh, on the institution. And so if you look at um, these uh, culture, social and uh, structural, you could say, okay, Juliet Garcia was very much structural putting the a, a unique partnership together of the university, partnering with a community college to create a pathway for her largely Latina students going, having an opportunity for four year education without having to travel 250 miles. So it was a very courageous thing she did. Uh, again, uh, I would say Judith Shapiro was more structural in terms of what it took to create Bernard's independence. Um, and I say Janetta Cole's uh, social because if you read her chapter, she talks about having to sort of pay attention to Southerness and what that meant in terms of being relational and accessible and uh, demystifying the idea of being president because that's how you kind of build trust. And she hadn't lived in the South except for the years she spent at, uh, I believe, uh, to, I forget the name of the undergraduate she went to in, in the South. But anyway, so I feel she was social in sort of us, the way her personality and her compelling draw that she had with all kinds of people really pulled uh, Spellman into this really amazing uh, social attribute to the whole country. It wasn't just here in Atlanta. So those are just some examples of, of the, that framework of culture, social, and structural. How fascinating. Um, so I, Michelle, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you talk to your co-editors now and, and sort of jump in and I'll come back with audience questions. Um, I do want to, I will put the name of the book in the chat. Um, some people have asked about that um, already, but um, I'll let, oh, well, actually I do have one more question, Michelle, because I'd love for you to tell us just sort of briefly the story of Molly Corbett Broad. It would be, it would be fascinating. Um, the first woman to lead the University um, of North Carolina um, and president of the American Council of Education. Would you tell, you know, would you tell us about her and where her strengths come? Sure. Uh, well, Molly Broad uh, came to uh, UNC Chapel Hill to lead the university as the first woman, the first non-North Carolinian and the first Catholic person to head this major public uh, institution in North Carolina. Um, and I would say what inspired her was really both of her parents were school teachers, not very well off. And she had one cousin who went to Syracuse and that's what she knew she wanted to do was go to Syracuse. And uh, her father said he couldn't afford it, but luckily for her, she, she managed to uh, be such an outstanding student, she got a full uh, scholarship to attend. And so she really started her, edu her higher education career at Syracuse and later came back to uh, start her administrative career at Syracuse um, after she got married and uh, headed up some major uh, administrative positions there. And then uh, she left to go to head up and become CEO at University of Arizona. And from Arizona, she was recruited to become the senior vice chancellor of, of California State University. And from there, she was um, uh, recruited to uh, UNC. And uh, California State, I believe had 23 campuses. So one of the reasons she really was uh, desired at UNC because UNC has 16 campuses and are very, very diverse campuses, five of which are historically black College, college campuses. Uh, there's one campus that's uh, primarily for Native Americans in North Carolina. And then of course you have UNC Chapel Hill, the flagship. And so she brought her experience with uh, 
managing multiple complex institutional um, higher ed institutions to UNC. And her uh, major initiative was something called the Focus Growth Initiative. And what she did was there were amongst the 16 campuses, there was such a disparity between all the assets and infrastructure at UNC Chapel Hill and the other 15 campuses spread out across the state. And after uh, putting together a committee to study infrastructure needs, she came up with a plan that called for an investment of $6 billion to try to bring some parity to infrastructure and uh, across, across the campus wide, across the university wide. And, uh, and this was also because she looked at some of the campuses, for example, couldn't take more students because they didn't have the capacity, but enrollment was being projected to increase by 30 some percent over a certain period of time. And so she saw the need to really, she was looking ahead at what the needs were to meet the changing demographics of the state. Uh, she also, as an economist, saw the university as an economic driver for the state's economy because North Carolina had moved from being agricultural based to being biomedical technology and so on research based. And so um, we know the research triangle uh, market that's there uh, it, uh, and she saw that. And so anyway, she was able to bring together unlikely uh, allies, all right? Between Jesse Holmes, Helms at the time and uh, African-American elected officials they were able to actually agree on the need for high quality education across the state. So she was succeeded in getting a bond measure passed, not for 6 billion, but for 3 billion. And the other smart thing she did was uh, extend it to community colleges. So two and a half billion went to the university systems and the remaining money about six, um, I think it was 6 million went to uh, the 59 community colleges in the state. And so she was able to really involve the community parents and people in barbershops and hair salons who all share this aspiration for their children's higher education to build the public support that was needed to get the bond approval and uh, elected officials. So it passed and that was her signature um, major defining, dis, uh, uh, dis, I would say policy and uh, experience at UNC that uh, brought about the most example of what it took to build a unified uh, purpose across a wide uh, constituency of stakeholders, um, what it meant to be participatory in her leadership by really bringing in uh, people from the community, bringing in faculty and so on to be part of the decision-making and a very smart media messaging campaign to really build public will. So uh, she was there for eight years and then went on to become the first woman president of ACE, the uh, Association of you know, higher education council. And so um, she, she's, her career basically is really her leadership in higher ed administration um, across the board. It just speaks, it's so interesting because it's so interesting. Oh, sorry, I was getting a feedback a little bit. I apologize. It's so interesting. Uh -huh. It really speaks to this idea of, I mean, being so thoughtful about how you're building support for such a transformational change such as that. So yeah, it's just a great example. Um, mm -hmm. so, so now I really am going to, I'm going to duck out and I'll be back in a little bit um, with audience questions. Please write your questions in the Q&A, the Q preferably, everyone, and um, I'll see you in a bit. So Michelle, it's back to you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I'm going to uh, start with uh, talking with uh, Carmen first about her chapter on Ruth Simmons. Yeah. And uh Carmen, nice to see you. Good to see you and, too. Uh, Ruth Simmons' story is both compelling and inspirational um, for many reasons. And right. would you, uh, as uh, the first African American person to head up an Ivy League university, can you sort of briefly give us uh, the highlights of her story? Right. So um, Ruth Simmons is, is certainly an inspiration to many, many folks, um, but certainly to uh, uh, black leaders in higher education. I think that she really stands out as someone that, that many of us look to. Um, she was born in, in 1945. And so that gives you a sense of the era that she was born in. Um, that very much impacted her um, growing up in the sort of Jim Crow South in Houston uh, and Jim Crow across the country really, but, but we'll call it uh, Jim Crow South for the purpose of this conversation. She was the youngest of 12 children. Uh, she was uh, the daughter of sharecroppers. 
And um, that sort of background very much influenced her. She was farming early on in her career, but they, the family moved to sort of the Fifth Ward in Houston um, and dealt with all of the sort of segregation and Jim Crow issues that were a part of, of our country at the time. And, and that is very much important to her authentic self. She talks about it a lot when she talks about how she thinks about her work uh, in higher ed. She still, she retired and then she came back out and, <laughs> and has been doing great things uh, down in Houston right now and went her career through USC, Princeton, Spelman in terms of leadership roles um, and Smith as well. Uh, a lot of women's colleges connections here on this screen and, and through many of the women um, in these roles. Uh, and then came to be the first uh, African-American leader of Brown. I think um, it's interesting that the uh, when you ask her the thing that she uh, is the most signature part of her career, it would not be what we're going to talk about right now. Um, she talks about uh, the decision to help Brown be a place that meets full need. Um, is probably her most signature achievement. But this uh, formation of this uh, steering committee on slavery and justice is what people talk about a lot. And it's in part because, remember, she's doing that 20 years ago in 2003. Mm -hmm. So those headlines seem somewhat interesting to us now, but she was really at the front line of this discussion about how do you redress uh, an institution's past. And the committee was formed to look at Brown's role in the slave trade. Um, and it was controversial because the community um, had had this kind of a pall over it in believing that the institution had no role in the slave trade. Um, and yet there were pockets who felt strongly that there was, and there hadn't really been any investigation of it. And so she formed this committee to do it. Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting, I'm sure Carol will appreciate this. So uh, those of us who are college presidents know that, uh, you know, our, the measures of our success are, you know, things like fundraising, admissions, curricular issues, um, you know, faculty um, awards, salary, all those strategic planning. And so I thought it was fascinating. She does this sort of in her first year or so uh, at, at Brown. And I asked her, why did you choose to use your political capital for that? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it was interesting to me because as presidents, we only have so much political capital. And typically we want to use that political capital on those things that people measure are success by. And mm -hmm. there was nothing really visible in the choice to form this committee that could lead a direct line to those things that we are quote unquote measured by. And so I just thought it was a fact like, wow. And all of her colleagues and friends thought it was a disaster, meaning her decision to do it, thought it would ruin her career, uh, thought she'd be run out of breath when she decided to do it. And so the interesting thing about her, are all the discussions that we had about how you make decisions as a leader, uh, about what um, helps you uh, think, have clarity about the choices that you make, about how you bring your authentic self to your leadership. Uh, and that's what makes uh, this story interesting. They formed the committee. Um, ultimately, it's a, a, a success. Uh, many wonderful new initiatives come from that work. Uh, when she's asked to speak publicly, she's spoken at the United Nations, at Goldman Sachs, at so many places about this specific choice. Uh, and it makes her compelling in so many ways. Yes, and, and what word comes to mind when I think of, of, of what you just described was, is courage. Yeah. The courage that it took to do something that no one thought of and what it led to subsequently in, in, in more recent years, right? In terms of, of reckoning our history right. with what we're dealing with today. And you could look at, uh, what is it, George Washington University in, in DC and you what they're doing with the ancestors. You look, you Georgetown, look at I'm sorry, every, yes. At almost every institution is thinking about these issues. Um, Ruth just did it 20 years earlier, <laughs> which, which feels very <laughs> much like Ruth uh, for those of us who know her. So um, yes. I think the other thing I would say about her is, um, you know, when I, I wish oftentimes I say this when I talk about Ruth, um, you know, we did a transcript of her, of my conversation with her. I had two um, really significant conversations with her. And I almost wish we could just do a book that just put that interview in it because there's so many jewels dropped. But I will remember that one of the things she said to me that I've taken to heart in my own leadership, and I was just beginning my presidency at Oberlin when I was interviewing her. And she said to me, it didn't feel bold. It just felt right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I... Um, keep on my mind a lot um, because she talks about uh, just trying to do the right thing 
um, as a leader and um, moving away from this natural desire to try to please people, uh, which she views as a, a futile attempt. Um, and so uh, what you should really do is try to do the right thing. And so all through this chapter, you see her tapping into her kind of authentic self. And by the end of this chapter, she gives some advice to all of us about what we bring to the table as leaders. And, and that notion of who we are is exactly what people are looking for in leadership. And yes. coming to accept that as a leader is an important part, of, I think, of her success. Yes. And so, you know, leading with conviction is another way to kind of think about what that means in terms of the courage it takes to kind of do something that's quote, unpopular, yeah. but driven by your instinctive sense of doing what is right. Yeah. Um, can I ask you, Carmen, this may not be a fair question, but given that uh, profile of, of, of uh, Ruth Simmons and, and what you just said about leadership, is there anything you can share during your tenure at, at, at uh, Oberlin that's challenged that part of your leadership? Oh, in terms absolutely. Of, yeah. absolutely. So we, we began at Oberlin thinking about how we would respond to the changing landscape of higher education and how it's impacting small private liberal arts colleges, right? People questioning our value, questioning our cost, um, uh, questioning all aspects of who we are. Uh, and at Oberlin, we had to do the work of starting to rethink ourselves. And so I, too, sort of put together this large group um, to help us sort of assess how we were doing our work. Um, it was not without controversy. Um, people's uh, questions about that. Uh, and, and what was great for me was that I was interviewing Ruth right as I was doing that. Uh, and one of the things she said to me, it was controversial when it began here at Oberlin. Um, and one of the things I'll never forget that she said to me is um, things, how things begin and people's upset and angst as things begin are oftentimes have no comparison to how things end. <laughs> uh, and so it was a reminder to me that people's angst and upset, it doesn't mean that Ruth didn't pay attention to people's concerns. She's a collaborative leader and she's very interested in people's perspective. Um, but it's not upset that bothers her. <laughs> uh, and, and I needed that at the time um, to know mm -hmm. that, that that's not how you judge whether this is the right thing to do or not people's upset doesn't mean you don't respond to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think the thing I would say about Ruth that I have come to appreciate now I'm in my, I don't even know what, what year I'm in in higher ed, but um, I've been a college president, maybe this is my 13th year. Uh, and one of the things she said to me that I think those of us in leadership have to come to at some point, um, and she's squarely there now, um, is that she said, I came to trust myself and to trust my leadership. Mm. Um, and one of the things I think that women in particular um, have to uh, work towards because we have all sorts of things in society that sometimes encourage us not to trust ourselves uh, is to come to trust your leadership. Now she had some evidence which she can use to trust herself, right? How she made decisions. Mm -hmm. But she was saying that to me in the context of a question I had for her about how she might have handled this situation when she was younger in leadership versus how she handled it now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this ability to learn how to trust yourself in leadership is I think part of the work that we all are striving towards and figuring out what markers help you trust yourself. You know, how do you mm -hmm. gather data? How do you put the right people around you? How do you think about decisions? So that by the time you get to a certain level in your leadership, um, as I say to my team all the time, it's not so much that I always feel totally confident about the decision I've made, but I'm pretty confident about the process I go through to make decisions. And that's yes. what gives me confidence in the decision. Uh, and so uh, Ruth is, um, you know, just an example to us all of how to take your authentic self uh, to the table um, and to trust yourself in the leadership role you're in. Thank you, excellent advice. Uh, thank you, Carmen. I'm going to now uh, turn to Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi. And um, we're, your chapter was on Hannah Gray, was as when she was doing her time when she was president of University of Chicago, and very intriguing story given what she inherited when she stepped into that role. 
so uh, tell us a bit about her story and her journey to, to, to leadership. Yeah, this has been such a fascinating conversation because each of these case studies provides so many lessons in leadership. And the lessons in leadership that I took from Hannah Gray's story were the following. First of all, how important it is to understand the landscape generally of higher education. One of the things Hannah said to me in our interview, which was so interesting, is she said the temptation when you come in as president is to try to fix everything that's wrong immediately. And she said, you have to be selective about your issues. And mm. picking well, depends both on understanding the landscape in higher education and also really understanding the institution that you're leading. So you're looking for this conjunction of an mm -hmm. issue that's significant in the larger world of higher education, but is particularly relevant at the historical moment when you're leading the institution. And mm -hmm. Hannah Gray um, became president of the University of Chicago in the early 1970s. This was not a good time for higher education. It was a time of stagflation. The University of Chicago had declining enrollments. It was in financial trouble. So, and, and but what she decided through this kind of double lens she had was on the one hand um, that she felt graduate education really needed rethinking at the University of Chicago. And secondly, she wasn't convinced that the undergraduate program, the graduate program and professional school programs were, uh, were, were ideally in balance. The way she went about, you know, the, these are fundamental institutional changes and um, institutional changes in areas where the faculty usually thinks that they are entitled to make the decisions. And the way she went about it was really, really interesting. I would say the various ingredients of it were, first of all, she selected two outstanding leaders on the faculty to lead to task forces to come up with recommendations and reports. And secondly, she communicated, she communicated, she communicated. Mm -hmm. She had lots of conversations with individual faculty, with groups of faculty. She used every organ of communication that was available to her. And she also really used the, understood and used the governance structures of the university. Mm -hmm. So she changed the University of Chicago profoundly, but it was hardly by coming in the first day and saying, I know what's wrong, but whoop, whoop, that, that's the way it is. It's a, the, a process of, I mean, um, uh, universities are very complex organizations and the authority mm -hmm. tends to be really distributed. So if you want to create major change, you have to be able to, um, to, to get people to, to join your parade and actually think they're leading your parade is the best mm -hmm. way. Thank you. And you know, when I read your chapter and, and she said they didn't even have a budget of office when she took over. That's not right. you first she got. Yeah. And then also what impressed me with her story is that she actually began with questions. She didn't come in That's with right. answers. That's right. And sort of, you know, and I looked at her when I thought about the uh, the different categories. I saw her as, as one great example of structural and cultural because she so much was a believer in the culture of the University of Chicago in terms of the independence of the faculty, the real rigorous attention to rigor and in academic in an academic life, and she didn't want to lose that. Uh, but at the same time, when you talk about the model of, that she put in place for graduate education, in particular, that became a national model, that's very much a structural change. Yes. So she kind of had this intersection of both the culture that she wanted to protect and preserve, and also change the structure but retain that culture. So yeah. I, I saw that as really what. What what stood out to me as her her major contribution and her juncture, yes. Yes. so um, yeah. And um, the other thing that came across was she said that there, there was a lot of time when people would approach her as you know being yeah. the, a woman. How does she respond to this propensity to just identify her basis of her gender as opposed to her skills? 
I, I, she really didn't like that. She said, people are much more interested in my gender than they are in my ideas about higher education. But I have a kind of mm -hmm. funny story to tell that I told in the, in the, um, in the chapter. Uh, Hannah Gray was born in Germany. She was um, uh, the child of German um, Jewish refugee parents. Uh, they fled uh, Germany first to the UK and then to the United States, where her father finally wound up teaching at Yale. And she grew up in a house of uh, a Jewish immigrant, you know, Jewish refugee, but mostly academics. And mm -hmm. uh, so she fast forward many years. She becomes the president of the University of Chicago. And at her inauguration, the chair of the board of trustees says, and now I am so excited to present to you the very first president of the University of Chicago, who, big pause, was born mm -hmm. in another country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, because I'm sure everybody was expecting the first woman, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's intriguing because you know when they when uh, Allison. Uh, conceived, conceptualized this series, it wasn't so much sort of down that uh, rabbit hole of, oh, the difference that women are as leaders in terms of biological differences or whatever, but really just trying to really create a platform for us to distill those qualities of leadership that these women, th these leaders who happen to be women bring to their institutions in higher ed that really are have been, these 12 profiles each of them really, really demonstrates, uh, even though they tell the stories that weren't so successful, but they did have success in their major junctures of decision-making that um, any leader would be challenged to succeed in. I mean, universities are a business model that is so complex. I don't know how you all do your jobs and <laughs> come here smiling like this in the midst of, of what's going on around in the, in the whole sector right now. So. Um, it, it's just an amazing, both uh, Ruth Simmons' story and Hannah's story as, as, a, as a child of immigrants uh, are fascinating in their pathway to get to leadership too, like where they started. And um, I don't know if you want to, uh, uh, Carmen, you mentioned it earlier about uh, the influence of, um, of, uh, of, of Ruth's upbringing as a parent sharecropping and how that uh, inspired her doggedness about education. And uh, Carol, likewise, Hannah came from an immigrant family that obviously was educated and privileged in many ways, uh, but she came to a university that was totally in shambles almost at a time, and she had to call on other skills, not just her academic brilliance, but really these interpersonal skills that are so much a part of what it takes to be have success as a leader in any, any, any sector. Yeah, um, no, I don't know if any of you all want to comment on any of that before we actually uh, just um, just one thing I, I, I this is also a theme in this conversation. Um, Hannah uh, uh, attributes a lot of her leadership and her achievement to having gone to Bryn Mawr, a women's college. And, That's right. Uh, and uh, one that took women's aspirations for graduate degrees very seriously. She also had, as Ruth Simmons had, varied institutional experience. Mm -hmm. She was dean mm -hmm. at Western. She was provost at Yale. Uh, she originally was a faculty member at the University of Chicago and comes back to be president. So um, I, I think that multiple institutional contexts give, uh, give, uh, give people perspective and experience that helps them make good decisions. Yeah, and I, I think Ruth yes. would say that that is certainly an important part of her own sort of framing of her own leadership. I also think that Ruth talks, she doesn't use this term as a term that I use, but I, I'll just say it in, in her stead, this sort of outsider's integrity, I think, that sometimes comes when you are a, a person who has been left outside the system sometimes in particular ways. Uh, and so mm -hmm. oftentimes these women um, were through their upbringing or other things were um, not in the system and they bring a kind of a critique that is helpful to making large institutional change. And so that's not a, a gender perspective, but it is true that many women have found themselves in that path uh, because of, of how our country's been built. And those are some of the um, integral sort of attributes that they bring to their analysis of the things that they should do, 
um, the work that they should be thinking about, and also how to help their constituencies respond to change, um, because they typically have been in these moments of major change in their own lives, and so they also are able to help uh, their constituents respond to the challenge of change. Um, and if, if leadership is, is, is anything, it is helping shepherd all the people with whom are part of your organization through change. I mean, that's really what it is. Uh, and sometimes right. I think women have had a perspective on that um, because of their careers and their personal experience. Thank you. So uh, Beth, I think you're coming back in to bring us home. I, am, I actually just want to continue listening, but I did promise the audience who have, have, are peppering us with questions both in the chat. And I apologize if Q&A wasn't working for a while. So I got questions in the chat. I even got some by email. So um, okay. I, have, I feel like I have so many questions based on that conversation about this idea of trusting yourself. It's fascinating, um, Carmen. And um, uh, well, let, let me ask the questions uh, from the audience first, and hopefully we can get to some of ones I have personally. Um, so uh, um, one question is, I'm just going to read it. It's, if your heart and mind tell you to make a decision that you feel is is right, you know, the process is, went through, yet pressure from other forces or perhaps finances pull you in a different direction, how have you rectified this? And um, I, ask, I guess I'll ask Carol first this and then Carmen. I think conversation is so important. I mean, it, it, when you're in an executive position like this, uh, if not every decision you make is popular, but I find that you have the best chance of keeping the community with you if you really listen to their points of view and you explain what is bringing you to the decision that you're making. That kind of sure route to, to lack of success is to just decide, decide something without consultation. It can be the rightest decision in the world, but if you don't... Um, uh, let the community into your thought process. It, it's going to be much harder for you. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I was I would say two things that Ruth said to me about this kind of very topic. Um, the first thing she said to me is that um, at the end of the day, the truth does not sow discord. Uh, and so uh, when Carol's talking about explaining how you got there, what your decision, how you are thinking about this. Uh, I think sometimes as leaders, we can shy away from giving people the facts as we know them and being clear about what's making us think in this direction um, and, and being willing to accept that the constituency can um, understand nuance and complexity and that there's not always clarity. Uh, and then the other thing that Ruth said to me about this is that one of the things you have to do as a leader is to get comfortable with the idea that there may not be a clarity in the outcome. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that once you can get comfortable with that, like, you know, I, I'm comfortable enough on, on this campus now to say, yeah, I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. Here's why I think we should go in this direction. Here are the things that we're considering. Here's how I'm thinking. And here's what I hope the outcome will be. But helping everybody know that there is lack of clarity in the outcome sometimes, I think also takes some of the pressure off from this um, push and pull of, I think it's the right thing, but these things are constraining me. Um, and, I, and I'm oftentimes saying, my caps, I know Carol does too. So let me tell you what came across the trends. I mean, like, let me just show, tell you what it is, right? Uh, as opposed to this kind of shroud of secrecy that I think sometimes breeds much more uh, interesting things than this really true Carol. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, the lack of communication gives room for the rumor mill, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I think also when you when you lead from conviction and you communicate, as Carol said, and you and you have the authenticity that like Carmen said, you can bring people along. They really want to trust your leadership you know, in that basis. I just think it's so important to trust your own instincts because in my own experience, looking back, it's when I didn't trust it that the decisions were not as optimal as they could have been because you're listening. And, and, and you know, to, to move away from with maturity, you kind of, you're not doing performative leadership. You really are leading from something deeper. And that really comes with experience and and passion and commitment to, to, to your role and to what it is that you're leading. Um, so it's all, it's a combination of those factors. That's a great, it was a great question. Um, 
Michelle, I'm going to turn this to you. Virginia has a question um, who, sa who says very nicely, I love this conversation. Thank you, Virginia. Question to panel. How did you get into leadership in higher ed? Was it a conscious decision to find opportunities or did the universe sort of speak to you? Michelle, why don't you take it first? Well, actually, uh, for 12 years, uh, I was a senior lecturer at the University of Nigeria. That was my entry into, into higher ed. I, uh, my husband's Nigerian, and uh, he was recruited to come back to Nigeria to head up, uh, to be part of, a, of uh, the foundational professors to form the first university of technology. He was a computer engineer. So when we went, um, of course, you know, my family thought I was a little crazy going around the world, going across the ocean with my little three kids and him. And, uh, and the University of Nigeria is in the town of, uh, has a huge campus of professional schools in the town that where we lived and where his university was. So he was at a state uh, university of technology and I was at the University of Nigeria. And I was the first woman faculty member in the department of estate management. My, my master's degree is in city and regional planning. They didn't have an urban planning department. So I taught urban and city planning in the department of estate management, which was kind of the closest thing to the kinds of subjects that you would do in city planning, economics, land economics, and so on. So that was my, and I spent 13 years and had a, an opportunity to also chair the department, to take a term as a department chair. Uh, so that was my, uh, interest, you know, entry into academia. And coming back to the U.S., I, my career has been in the nonprofit sector, but also with issues related to uh, gender and racial equity, with reproductive health, with women-led philanthropy. And then um, just before uh, leaving uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, president of the Women's College Coalition that gave me an opportunity to really learn and work with women college presidents across the country in a very intimate way. Um, and so that's my experience. And really, you know, there, there are similar, there are things that carry with you when you're in leadership, whether you're in a university or heading up an NGO or maybe handling, heading a business, there's leadership qualities that trans, trans cross that, that there's not, oh, I'm a leader in higher ed, so I only do this. They, they cross pollinate, if you will. Yeah, so it's fascinating, and they do, I'm sure. So I'd be called the name of the, the forum, Higher Ed and Beyond. You <laughs> did that very well. Carmen, how about, how about you? And how, what, tell us your, how, how you. Well, you know, I think mine is sort of a combination of a choice, but also sort of stars aligning. So I'm a lawyer by training, um, but I was interested in education policy. So that's what my focus was at Princeton and my master's degree. So I, I honestly thought I would be uh, the general counsel. That's kind of what I thought I would be doing at a college or university. Uh, when I went back to Princeton to run the graduate programs that I was connected to, uh, the thing that happened that I think it's kind of the universe reaching out. When I went to think about being Dean of Douglas and the folks here on this panel are connected via Douglas too. Um, so that's another uh, women's college that we're all connected to. Um, I was sitting in the interview and it was one of those uh, typical uh, higher ed uh, type interviews with 25 people around the table interviewing the candidate uh, in this particular instance. And um, I was relatively young um, applying for this role. Uh, and so someone sort of jokingly said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I think I was 31 or so. Uh, and I can remember just kind of going, oh, you know, in your mind, like, okay, what, what do I say? I'm applying for this role as dean. Um, and I just said, not really thinking uh, that I want to be a college president. And there was an African-American woman on the panel that was interviewing me, Cheryl Wall at Rutgers. And she said to me before this group of 30 people, not knowing me at all, you will be a college president. You will be one. Um, and that was it. Uh, and that was the thing that pushed me into this role. Um, you know, Cheryl recently passed away, but she came to Oberlin to introduce me as the, as the new president of Oberlin. And when you bring people who know you, um, she was integral to my career and was the first person that planted that seed of that is possible. You can do it. Absolutely. This is what you should do. Um, and it was just, frankly, I think, a more senior African-American woman looking at a young upstart African-American kid really uh, 
and saying, affirming for her, affirming for me what I had imagined in an instant that that was possible. Uh, and she wanted me to know, um, sort of sister to sister, you will be one. That's really powerful. I mean, that, that's amazing. Um, well, Carol, we want to hear. We want to hear your. Story. Yeah, I my chain, uh, my uh, path was much more evolutionary. I started doing the things that faculty members just expect they're going to do. I chaired my department, um, but then as I I um, was given the opportunity to do more and more, um, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, jobs with bigger portfolios, I realized how much I liked this, and so um, so it was really I didn't have any any uh, ambition. Uh, when I was young or when I was in graduate school of being a leader in higher education. And did, I'm curious how you, how did, how did Smith occur? Did you, did, was that? I, I was the um, executive, I, I, when I was in graduate school, I always wanted to go to a small liberal arts New England college. And I got a job offer from Berkeley as my first job. And I remember crying all night because I knew my dissertation director would never let me turn it down. It was a really good job. Um, but then when I finished being the executive vice chancellor and provost here in the 90s, um, I went back to the faculty. That's what I thought I was going to do. And I realized, no, I've really changed careers. I'm really in educational leadership. And then uh, Smith started knocking on my door and I thought, oh, my New England college. I can't have it. <laughs> so I went there. Then I came back to Berkeley to retire. And, um, and I was tapped to be, and the provost resigned very suddenly for personal reasons, and I was tapped to be an interim provost and then asked to be chancellor. So this is a kind of unexpected piece of my career. I thought it was going to end when I stepped down from the presidency of Smith. Good leaders never, never end. <laughs> we never go. <laughs> Um, this is, uh, gosh, we're running out of time. So well, this is from, this is from Lori. Um, we, I'm going to read it directly to you. We, Dr. Am, Amber's uh, approach to, uh, at Oberlin, you were dealing with the value of a liberal education as well as the value of an arts and society, specifically mm. through your conservatory, which is a wild, wildly expensive model of education. How did you parse those two and where did they land? Um, you know, arts and education are inextricably interconnected to Oberlin. Yeah. I'm not quite sure we parse them in the sense that I think that the, the value of Oberlin is because we have those two divisions uh, and it's because they come together in this unique way that we sort of talk about as a third space, right? I jokingly sort of say this is where innovation and creativity breed, right? That that's what happens here at Oberlin. Uh, it's true that they are, uh, that our model just in general in higher education is a high cost model. Um, some of the work that we're all trying to do is to help our families appreciate uh, the value of this experience. And in some ways, I think um, the experience we've had in the pandemic um, has um, helped people reevaluate what it means to be on a campus and to be part of a residential experience. It's not to say that the other methods of delivery don't have value, they do, um, but we all have uh, recognized what we lost in not being able to be together. Um, and the only thing I think we have to do at liberal arts colleges is to help people see um, how liberal arts is engaged in a way that helps people think about their lives after Oberlin and what that work will be in very clear and distinct ways uh, that still keeps the broadness and the rigor and the critical thinking, cultural competency, all those things that we know the liberal arts brings, but also says to our students that they're gonna launch effectively from our institutions. And so we try not to break it up in that way, but just try to demonstrate our value in different ways to our families. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we'll be doing at Oberlin um, is guaranteeing a funded internship uh, for every Oberlin student. So we're gonna launch that in yeah. the next um, few months here. And that's sort of demonstrating that um, you can take this degree and have a broad framing on it and still be able to launch effectively into the things that you really care about, right? And um, always in particular, but students at liberal arts colleges more, more broadly uh, want to make the world be different. Um, I say all the time, the world needs more Oberlin graduates and it's because they want to change the world for good. And what happens at a, a liberal arts college, and particularly Oberlin, is that they get all of the skill sets that they need to go out and meet the world as it is, but then also change it for good. And that's that's the value of this experience. Yeah. Good. I, I'm gonna. Well, oh, I have one question coming in that I, I, I 
a couple of questions have come in that we're not gonna be able to get to, but I'll, I'll try to respond to the participants afterwards and maybe catch Michelle. Um, but, but I, you know, it, I realize this is leadership in general, but what, what I'm very curious and, and one of the um, participants are, what, what do you see the, the biggest challenges in higher ed? I know we can go, but that could be a whole separate um, issue, but you know, through the lens of leadership and through the lens of um, women leadership and Kara, I'll start with you. Well, I think there are two um, really big challenges, which are also opportunities. I mean, one is the growing diversity of the population of the United States and the fact that our institutions are not becoming as diverse as the population is. And uh, I, I just this early this morning, I had an orientation for new faculty and the first presentation was about how you teach to a diverse student body. So I think diversity is not only diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging is how we put it, yeah. um, is a huge challenge generally in our country, but particularly for higher education with its um, requirements that we change the kinds of institutions that we are. And the second thing, which is both a challenge and an opportunity is the pandemic. I keep looking for silver linings in the pandemic. The pandemic has uh, cut the, 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 the link between place and instruction and more. Mm. And so we have this new set of digital tools that people are newly fluent with. Look at us on Zoom. We wouldn't have done it this way two years ago. Yeah. And, um, and so what do we make of that? So those are two of the, two of the big ones. Yeah, I would, I would agree, absolutely. And I would say on the second one, so the first one I've been saying, and Carol has too, that the institutions that get this right, the, the piece around racial equity, diversity, and inclusion, and how we change ourselves will be the most sought after institution in the country. So you know, the, those of us who can try to figure out how to get that right, we will be the institutions of choice. Uh, on, on Carol's second one, I think that you know, we've been marching towards this challenge of place the divide for a while and the pandemic just codified it and made it really clear um, that we have to figure out how we're going to think about how we deliver this experience in all sorts of ways uh, and how it impacts those things that we know are really valuable about our institutions. And, so we all are trying to figure out what I've been jokingly calling COVID learning, right? What have we learned from, <laughs> what have we learned from this uh, that we can apply to this experience? Um, so just one quick example, you know, Oberlin's, in Oberlin, Ohio, uh, we don't get a chance to get the sort of, um, I'm traveling down the East Coast to go to all the schools um, because we did uh, virtual recruitment all last year. Um, but there was more equity across our competitors. We are bringing in the highest number of students that we've ever brought in in Oakland's history after a pandemic. Yeah. That just shows you that there are some things we need to take from COVID around how we recruit virtually, even though we may go back to a system where we have in-person admissions, right? So there are things that we can learn about our institutions that we're going to need to change, and COVID has helped us. But it's also been a tremendous challenge for many colleges and universities and how many of us will emerge from this stronger, that is a question mark, right? Because of its, its challenge. Mm -hmm. If I could just weigh in a little bit, I know we have, we're almost out of time, but I think what I think about in terms of where the, the sector's uh, opportunity is, is at, in, a, in a larger sense, we have to really do a better job of making the notion of education so important and essential to a healthy democracy and get off the defensiveness about the value of education. I think that's the call of the entire sector mm -hmm. and the leadership needs to, I think in higher ed, I come with, as a little bit from an outsider in the sense of, of majority of my career being in the NGO world of activism. We're not the best advocates for our sector. And so we were caught, put on the defensive by you know, the technology world and, and everything was sort of reduced to what's the earning power of your degree. Well, you know, philosophy still has relevance if you look at the history of democracy and it's up to us to figure out how do you frame that to be relevant to the 18 year old today that it has value. So I think Carmen's model about making this uh, internship uh, for our, our liberal arts 
students is so important because becoming relevant to solving the complex social problems is key if this sector is going to really endure in the future. Um, so I think the key thing is preserving our democracy and, and really making it clear an educated citizenry is key. If we don't have it, Langston Hughes said, the US will either kill ignorance or ignorance will kill the US. And it's sort of, he said that how many years ago? Uh, oh, wow. And now here we are. <laughs> so. The great, well, the conference, such great questions are coming in. I wish we had another hour, but we do not. And I'm so sorry, oh. wonderful conversation. Um, I'm so grateful to Michelle, to Carol, to Carmen um, for joining us. Um, we will, we did record this. This will be sending out to all the participants and all the registrants, um, as well as turning to a story. We will embed this as well. So st stay tuned to watch it more. Thank you so much for everyone. Attending. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, but uh, what a fascinating conversation. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And here's the, um, the name of the book as well for people to, to join in. I'm going to end it now. Bye.